<laughs> takes me forever to get anywhere. So recently, as you can see, my leg is broken. Recently, as you cannot see, one of my best friends passed away about four months ago. Not so recently, and also as you cannot see, my mom passed away about 15 years ago. And people ask me then, and they ask me now, how are you? They try to understand, but they cannot see whether under my blue cast or beside my emotions. But answering that question is complex, as I'm sure you know from your own experiences with grief. Before I get into answering that question, I have a question for you, which should come as no surprise if you've ever spent more than five minutes with me. So turn to your neighbor and ask them, how many people do they see today in crutches, in a wheelchair, disabled, or injured? Go ahead, ask them now. So I have a hunch that very few of you have an accurate count of the number of people they saw today injured or disabled, because why would you keep a tally of that in your head? But you know what's weird? I can tell you how many I saw today, and yesterday, and the day before that. Because ever since January 12th at 5.35 p.m. when I heard my leg break, I became temporarily disabled. I became more aware. I started to see these people. And so now, all over the place, whether in line for the elevator or at the movies, we have a small exchange, a nonchalant head nod, or a small smile that just says, I see you. And I can understand a small bit of your reality living with a physically altered ability. But that awareness is not quite as simple or present when it comes to those hurts that are more internal. We can see my cast. We know what crutches looks like. We know how to identify a wheelchair. But guessing who is grappling with a heartbreak or struggling with a loss, well, that's just harder to see. And so today, I want to share with you antidotes of my experience with grief. Even though I did take Psychology 101 online last semester, I am no expert in grief. And so today, I want to share with you my personal truth of experiencing grief as a human. I want to explore with you the connection of how I believe grief is like water. And so my hope is that by exploring three paradigms of the relationship of water and grief, we will all leave this TEDx talk thinking a little more intentionally about those who are hurting, especially those who are hurting in ways we cannot see. Because despite how I and many others appear in photos or conversations or in public, there's always something more going on underneath the surface. So let's jump into this comparison headfirst, because I can't really go at feet first right now. Simply put, water has an effect on us. Every day we interact with water countless times, drinking, bathing, cooking, swimming. But what if we had to be introduced to water as adults? And what if that first interaction was a wave that came over you suddenly without a warning. So imagine yourself at the beach near the shore, and out of nowhere, I mean all of a sudden, a giant, powerful wave crashes on you onto your back, pushing you forward into a face full of sand. There would be salt in your nose and sand in your bathing suit. You would be disoriented and stunned, and it would be uncomfortable. If you had to be introduced to water as an adult, a transparent, colorless <coughs> liquid, especially so violently and suddenly, your ability to recognize that form would become muddled. Hot, cold, boiling, frozen, salty, still, running, sparkling. There are so many forms of water. Similarly, grief has an effect on us. Four months ago, my former sweet mate, apartment mate, sorority sister, and best friend passed away. At 21, Wynne lost her life suddenly and tragically. And grief hit me like falling through a frozen pond, unexpectedly shocking my system. Or maybe it hit me like a scalding shower, fiery streams just hailing at my back. Or maybe it hit me like a hot, sticky southern evening an inescapable humidity coating my skin and just making it really hard to breathe. Because disclaimer, no one moves to North Carolina with a 
the summer heat. Loss of mobility, loss of a mother, loss of friendship, loss of relationship, loss of freedom. There are so many ways of grief. But just because grief and water have an effect on us, it does not mean that we as humans do not have power to respond, react, press forward, and literally dry off. Every day, we interact with water. It is a part of our everyday life. We know how much we need to drink it every day in order to get by, which is 32 ounces, and how we like to drink it. My friend Wynn loved to drink her water in a silver thermos filled with hot water and lemon. The combination was so pure and detoxing, it matched her energy, you could say it was on brand. When I drink that combination now, it reminds me of her. <coughs> Sipping on that acidic tea-like water stings my tongue before warming me up and entering my body. And it tastes like grief. Because that lemon <coughs> warm water combination reminds me of when, when I drink it, I feel connected to her. In a small way, it helps me cope. Similar to water, grief is a part of our everyday life. And as time passes, we understand how we can carry it with us in a manageable way because it is not easily shaken off. <coughs> that process of learning how to identify, manage, and carry our grief with us in a manageable way is a long process, and it looks different for each of us. Even though not so much right now, I am an avid marathon runner and yogi. And I have found physical exertion to be my vessel to carry grief with me from one day to the next. But that looks different for me now. And so while you can't and physically won't find me running mile splits for the next two months, you should check out my upper body work routine because I'm going to be really jacked, just you wait. But in all seriousness, there are so many ways we can carry our grief with us, whether or not it is the way we originally thought we needed or what we were comfortable with. Writing, journaling, cooking, praying, sleeping, meditating, partying, therapy. There are so many ways we can carry our grief. But sometimes all you can do to manage grief is to breathe. Like sometimes all you can do to drink your water is to sip. Recently I did what iGen does and I went on Instagram for a little bit of inspiration for this TEDx talk. I opened an Instagram survey which allowed my followers and friends to direct message me their responses to the following question. What comes to mind for you when you think about the relationship between water and grief? One answer stood out. It was from Wynne's mother, and she told me this. People will tell you that grief comes in waves, but I think that disregards that water and grief is always there and always flowing. Because, yes, there are waves, and some that can drown you, but no one warns you that you are still wet when the water receives. And so let's imagine we're back at the beach. We see someone soaking wet coming out of the waves. I mean, their hair is matted to their head, and their clothes are stuck to their chest. And you know exactly what to do to dry them off. You rush up to them with a big towel, and you wrap them in it. And imagining this scenario has me thinking, why is it that when people see others <coughs> with a physical need, we feel so much more prepared to support them than when their needs are more internal, even if we know those internal needs are there? Humans have this incredible instinct to care for others when we see them in need. But what if you can't see them in need? What if the days, months, and years have passed from the original tragedy and the deep scars that are left behind and no longer visible? That those silver crunches are no longer there, and that you, there is no head knock on the street to acknowledge their existence? Because even after this blue cast comes off, I will still have my screws in my leg. Or even after I graduate from the University of North Carolina in May, I will always have a friend who never made it with me. And the question arises, how can we as humans look out for those who have losses that are more internal? How can we as humans learn to see those people who are, as Wynne's mom puts it, still wet when the water recedes? I realized recently the importance of proximity for humans to care. It's like there are two ways that you can really be involved in a situation. 
The first one is that it personally affects you. The second way is that it affects someone so close to you that you cannot unsee it. And so I challenge you with this question, why is it that we need to have an experience of tragedy or great loss in order to look out for others who are in need? And I've found the answer to be in understanding the sacredness of a shared human experience. And when that shared experience is out of reach for you, learning how to listen, hold the proverbial door open, and wait for that injured individual to crutch through and share their story. In the Christian church, we have a ceremony known as the Holy Baptism. And in the ceremony, the candidate is immersed in water or sprinkled by it. And it marks the entrance into the church and to the wider congregation. And the water that is used in the ceremony is sanctified, it is consecrated, it is set apart. And so when we are washed by that water, we too are set apart. We are set apart from the rest of the world together in a shared experience with those who have gone before us through the same ritual. And I have found grief to be a very similar process. A quote that kept reoccurring during and after Wayne's death resurfaces appropriately here. Grief is the price we pay for loving. And when you feel particularly pained, you question if it's worth it. But then the question arises, would you choose never to love and therefore never to grieve? And the answer is obviously no. Grief is the price we pay for loving. Grief is a sanctification process. <coughs> we are set apart by grief when we choose to love. We are set apart together with others who chose to love and therefore are mourning the loss of that shared person. Because grief doesn't just touch you, it drenches you. From the inside out, you are consumed by it. And so you are set apart. When you choose to love and therefore ultimately have to choose to grieve. Loss of a mother, loss of a relationship, loss of a friendship, loss of freedom, loss of mobility. There are many forms of grief. Hot, cold, boiling, salty, still, frozen, sparkling, running. There are many forms of water. And then that question resurfaces, how are you? I am sick 